So we kind of set that initially on the, on the tibial cutting guide, shooting for about seven degrees or so. Would you ever uh, redo, so not the, an exact redo science. the cut in, the, in a, a CRN in this situation, or you j just try and release it a bit? Well, I, I thought that I thought that ten was pretty good. Mm -hmm. when, when it, only, it only lifted off when she was kind of when her the fat in the back of the thigh so was hitting the hypothetically, if calf. you put the if you put the ten in and you felt that you were perfect in extension and you went into flexion, felt you were a little bit tight. Uh, Phil's just sort of asking the question: How would you manage that? Would you put more slope yeah, on th the Yeah, then tibia? I could cut a little more slope. And how much um, lift off will you accept? I, I, don't really, I, I don't really like any lift off. So we, we'll have to do something then about this, this 10, will we? Because I, I saw a little bit of lift off. I think we all did. Uh, that was with the 11 in. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah, that was with the 11. The, 11 okay. where you saw the lift off. the other thing you had to be with careful. With the 10, it was only when I kind of made that final push Correct. To, to kind of get her heel to touch uh, her bottom there. So this is, a, this is also a new instrument, which I, which I like. Kind of clamps right on. Just makes it very easy to, to do your patella. Everybody likes that tool. It's a nice instrument. And then we'll take, um, we'll take off this lateral facet here, just so it's not rubbing up against the the shoulder of the implant there. I don't know if it's some, some people say it's a neurolysis, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. But one thing, Brett, how do you set, like to see how that. do you set the position of the of the patella here? How do you know if, how far to medialize so I, it? I try to medialize it as, as much as I can, particularly in a valgus knee. <coughs> Would you downsize to get more medialization or? or? Potentially, if in, you know, as long as it wasn't swimming. Right. Yeah, I mean that's what like I in this case, I probably could have put a. Th I could have probably put a thirty-eight on there if I really wanted to. Yeah. yeah I think what you want to do is medialize but I also it think and then see what you feel is superior to inferior. Right. I medialize it and then. And then I think the thickness component. overall would have not right. been uh, what I wanted. So when we flex her up, you can. If you look inside, I don't know if you can see inside, but the patella is right on. And then I'll kind of check, looking in figure four, coming medial, make sure I, I have contact <coughs> at all time between the femur and the tibia. So I'm pretty happy with that. Looks good. Perfect. Then to take the poly out, you just kind of lift up. And that'll come out. And the part that I tend to forget from the next gen is now we, gotta, we actually have to drill our lug holes for our femur here. And this is where you can adjust if you're not happy with the medial lateral position. You can adjust it medial laterally before you fix the position. Yes. One That's way to, if you're a PS guy, what I do is as we're cutting for the box, and I've obviously, once you do that, you made your decision, hand. medial lateral Slap position. I, well, the cutting the box I have with my other hand, I'm drilling those two holes so you don't forget. That's, that's, a, that's what I now have done on every one of them. So recip saw comes in one hand and kind of doing that. <coughs> you can open those boxes. Sure. All right, we'll take our tower and drill for. I like this too. This kind of sits in and holds down. And then we have our stop on our on the drill there so that it'll only drill as far. I don't know if you can see the increments here, but it's going to stop at our E, which is what we have. And this is our, our resident's favorite part where they, where they take the, uh, the handle and they flip it back like a shotgun. This is Aaron's favorite part. He gets yeah. really pounded. I know. Have we, have we termed that yet? Uh, I, we designed this based on the scene in Terminator 2, where Linda Hamilton is going after the Terminator and pumping the shotgun with one hand. It's nice. <laughs> it is my favorite part of the case, I gotta say. And then these Stop pins are, are magnetic, which is nice. 
You guys up there are easy to please. Well, <laughs> you saw what gets him off. <laughs> Drilling the cortex there. Yeah. All right, you gotta come over there. Now we'll wash things up and get ready to cement. Do you do any, you use the um, Aquamantis posteriorly or, or no? Yeah, we, we don't have that um, available at Elmhurst, so, oh. so we don't use it. What we've been doing is injecting transazamic acid into the capsule um, at the end of the case and clamping the drain for an hour. So you're putting the transazamic acid in the joint? Intra-articular? Yeah, intra-articular. Yeah, yeah there's good data yeah, that the, suggests the, that it works as well as it does when you give it intra intravenous. Yeah, I use and less, less of a concern about cardiac issues or, or contraindications to giving it. So um, yeah, right. it's interesting. You templated for an 8E, and you got an 8E. It's mm -hmm. great. It's it's the digital template plating is pretty accurate. Kind of like you said, when you put the tibia on, you only have to go through two sizes. When you put the templates up, you put on two sizes, and those are really the only options. The other ones are either way too small or way too big. So it, it's pretty rare that we're off more than one size. Do the radiologists or the techs know that they have to put a marker on the films, or how do you make sure that your films are appropriately sized to yeah, the template? If you look at that film there, you'll see a marker on the, on the lateral right in front of the patella. It's, it's pretty easy to do on knees because when you do it on the lateral, you know, you can, you can put it right in the middle on a, on a knee, on a hip. You know, some of my patients, it's hard to find a greater trochanter. It's actually sometimes hard to fit them on the x-ray table. Yeah, you got a lot of biscuit poisoning. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they get referred in from other offices. Uh. <laughs> yeah, if, if my patients, when they get yeah, out of the chair with arms, if the chair Black comes head. up with them, they go to Dr. Levine. <laughs> <laughs> we have wider chairs downtown. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I, the first day I worked at, at Rush, I had finished my fellowship, I drove back from Boston, I went in to find out if I could get advance on my salary because I was in big debt and I walked in and they said, no, you can't. And I said, when do I get paid? They said, two weeks after you start working. I said, okay, I'm working today. And uh, I was walking down the hall and there's George Galante, he comes out of his office, he's looking at me, he says, are you working here now? I said, yes, sir, I am. He says, good, because I am never operating on another fat person again. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that's what he said, the first thing he said to me. And it was true, he never did. I <laughs> I'm looking forward to being able to say those words. <laughs> Time's coming. Maybe about 10 years. <laughs> the problem is the patients just keep on getting bigger. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to happen in the Midwest. Yeah. Probably talking into selling silver. <laughs> what what kind of cement do you use? Antibiotics in the cement or plain cement? Yeah, we're doing Palico cement. We're adding our own antibiotics in there on the back table. It takes a couple extra seconds. It is a little, uh, little cheaper that way. What are you adding? Tobra. So I can ask Gil, Aaron, and um, Brett first. At this point in time, would either one of you guys, any of you guys now say, I can't wait for this? Smaller incision. I don't have to rip. Yeah, I mean, I'm waiting for the uh, the PS to come out, which I think should hopefully be by the year's end. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to doing that. 
I was always waiting for the uh, trabecular metal to be on the uh, thermal component too. I'm going to talk about that uh, mm -hmm. a little bit later today, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. Well, Brad, how about you? Brad, how about you? Are you? Yeah, I'm you ready for the uh, TM? I, yeah, I, I put a bunch of the TM modular in with the next gen, and you know it's nice not to have to dig cement out. I don't know if I would do it because I can make a smaller incision or any of that stuff, but I, I think I would do it because I, I don't like having to dig the cement out of the knee. And from a time standpoint, I guess, do, do you think anybody here believe that maybe this will be for everybody or is it going to be patient selection? Gil? You know, I think it, it probably will be patient selection depending upon the quality of the bone. Yet the TM has been looking good on, um, on the uh, next gen. Uh, trays on uh, almost all patients. Aaron, do you? What do you well, think? yeah, I think it's probably going to be very much patient specific, only in the sense that in the very osteopenic patient, I have much less faith in the initial fixation characteristics of anything. Um, and cement does so well in the osteopenic patient that certainly in the elderly female or the uh, otherwise osteopenic patient, I would avoid it. Um, but I think it's a very reasonable choice and patients with reasonably good bone stock. So probably, probably you should see improvements, I guess, potentially, in those sclerotic patients where you just cannot get cementative education. Maybe that'd be the ideal candidate. Well, I, yeah, but though I'm not sure that that sclerotic bone does a great job of ingrowing either, where there's really just like a marble white surface. Yeah, so I, I think, Aaron, you're absolutely right. I think that bone's going to have to be prepared, you know, below that sclerotic bone. You yeah. know, it's not going to grow At the end through. of the day, the, the, the biggest problem for me is that if I take a look at my own series and the series at Rush, aseptic loosening of the tibial or femoral components in the cement and knees has not occurred. I mean, we're out at 13, 14 years now in our long-term next-gen follow-up. And aside from a late or early sepsis, the only reason is the loosening of these components in patients who get infected. But we have not seen aseptic loosening. So. Uh, I think maybe I, in very young patients it might be reasonable, but... Yeah, I think it's very reasonable. It's, it's certainly, I'm going to be using it in my youngest patients first and, uh, and seeing where we go with it in patients under mm -hmm. the age of 50. My biggest concern with cemented fixation is in the 45 to 60-year-old male that's six foot four, used to play football, n now weighs 280 but weighed 260 with little body fat when he was in college, and the only thing wrong with him is that knee. And once you fix it, they're going to go tromping around on it. Those are the guys that I worry about. We, um, we also, I'm, I'm from, from Houston, where I think the patients may be a little bit bigger than here. Um, well, that's Texas, Bill. Yeah, right. Every really? Right. Er everything's <laughs> bigger in Texas. That's right. Live Have you been to my office? <laughs> right. um, so we, we actually see the other end of the spectrum. So in... Um, the, the biggest of our patients, um, patellofemoral issues come up um, and we have a pretty high instance, mm -hmm. about 30% of lines around the patella component. Uh, the idea of going to cementless in those people clearly is, is, is out. Yeah, so we, we're just trying to improve our cementing or not resurface at all for those people. Well, I would agree that the only patellofemoral problems I have had with uh, subluxation, uh, uh, just on the x-ray, not clinically, that almost always gets better in the really fat women with exercise, with building their quads up. But I do have some radial loosen line formation. I have two cases over the past 15 years in morbidly obese females that are moderately active despite their morbid obesity of patellar component loosening. And so I have stopped resurfacing patellas only in the women above 300 pounds. Right. And, uh, and I'll wait and see what happens. I don't have enough data to <laughs> say anything of, of much interest about it yet, but the only place I'm concerned with cementing my components. And I have seen patients... You How know, about over 400? <laughs> yeah. Does it reverse? <laughs> the concern that we have also is that the, the, there was a subgroup of patients long term that in the femur they, they have significant bone loss. And so you sort of, every time you see their lateral, you're kind of hoping that this lasts, you know, more years without there being some sudden event. My problem is in the really obese patients, I, on the lateral, I can't get a good sense of how, what, what's going on with the bone. Because you know, there's so the much soft tissue shadow in the really heavy patients. Well, looks like a nice knee there, son. She's going to make it, I think. Are you uh, happy with the coverage of your uh, femur 
now that you downsized to a narrow, or you have any lack of coverage? Is that yeah, a concern? You, yeah, it's, I mean, there's no overhang here medially, and then laterally. Yeah, you were right there's on the There's no overhang right. either. You'll see that better when we flex up. So that's an interesting question. The question is, is underhang a problem? And so I've been working on knee design for uh, pretty seriously since the early 1990s. And I remember looking at lots of John Insall's x-rays, and I got Gil Scuderi here who grew up at John's uh, uh, knee, so to speak, from a youngster to the mature individual he is now. And my impression, looking at the earliest x-rays, back when there were three sizes of total condylars, and then five sizes for the posterior stabilize, is there were plenty of cases where I saw undersized femurs out to 15, 20 years that looked fine. I can say that I've never seen a case where an undersized femur got loose or subsided even per se. I mean, I'm wor much more worried about undersizing on the tibia than they, I am on the femur. So given a choice, I would much rather underhang than overhang. And I like it to be perfect, of course, but the question I guess I have for Gil, is there a downside to having an undersized femoral component? Yeah, I, I don't want to use the word undersized. I'd rather say uncovered areas because, I mean, the size is correct, but there are some times where medial or laterally you'll see uncovered bone. I'm okay. not sure what the absolute answer is. We have to see over time. Um, it, it does concern me uh, when I have four or five millimeters of uncovered bone around an implant. But uh, in general, I have not seen it to be a major negative factor. Overhang, we know is a problem. Or my Mahoney has shown us and others, you know, that if you get three millimeters of overhang, a high incidence of pain due to soft More likely to cause pain. symptoms. Yeah. But I have wait, to say, the, I don't, I've <coughs> never seen a case where I thought an undersized femur was giving symptoms or was responsible for failure, that is aseptic loosening of the component. We find, um, something quite different, and I know uh, Scott Banks in Florida has found the same thing. If you go through the retrieval collection, you will find there's about a 10% uh, knees that are, that are revised or, or are ob obtained after death that have got um, large, large gouges in the polyethylene surface and when you, uh, that are kind of mysterious, and they're on the, typically the medial and the lateral edges. When you look at the x-rays and you look at the whole specimen, it's